Okay? Thank you. Today I want to talk to you about steam. And as our politicians have gone, you won't be saying, is there not enough hot air in Stormont? Uh, steam. Uh, the theme is momentum, and I thought we would talk about steam. Over two centuries ago, the invention of the steam engine powered the Industrial Revolution. It was the momentum behind the industrialization of modern civilization. It propelled Europe and the United Kingdom to the forefront of global economies. And it took place in a period of unprecedented creativity and innovation, and an almost obsessive belief that things can always get better. Move forward to the 21st century, and we are in the midst of a different revolution, probably best known as the knowledge revolution, propelling the knowledge economy. What do I mean by that? It's a phrase that's very much used in the media, but probably not very clearly articulated. Put simply, it is saying that the effective utilization of intelligence, of knowledge, is what will create wealth, what will create innovation, and what will push us forward in world markets. If you think, for example, about the car, that's the icon of industrialization in America. The car generally was pr produced in large factories, large production lines with the same person repeating the same task. In a post-Fordist society, the car is a supercomputer. It's much less about the metal, and it's much more about aerodynamics, it's much more about efficiencies, it's much more about entertainment. The car is the computer. In fact, even when I take the car to the garage now, he says, I'm going to put it up on the computer. I do look a bit bewildered, but that's how the world has changed in terms of knowledge. It is my contention in this talk that the knowledge economy should also be driven by steam. What does she mean by that? I want you to hold that thought for one second, and I'll come back to it. In recognition that we didn't have the skills, we didn't have the knowledge to push us forward in this new world. Over the last decade, governments have relentlessly, pushing down here, promoted the STEM agenda. Most of you who have children in school, who've just been through university, will know very well what that acronym stands for. It is ubiquitous in government policies, and it's ubiquitous through schools from the very early age. In fact, I'm told it's now in nursery school, it's certainly in primary school, post-primary school, and higher education. What is STEM? Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. A promotion of those subjects um, through a whole range of programs with outside organizations now being funded to simply push forward the STEM agenda. Government is also diverting funding towards the STEM agenda. And actually, I believe there's no question that the STEM agenda is essential. But I would contend that STEM alone is missing a trick. We are missing a set of creativity components that are crucial if we are going to have a cutting edge competitiveness. In this case, I am suggesting that we need to add the A to STEM to make it STEAM. So if we think of STEM, as the recipe for success. The missing ingredient is A, to turn it into steam. What in this case am I talking about? A, in this particular case, refers to the arts. Unfortunately for the arts, they have an image problem. They suffer from negative perceptions. So I'll give you a second, and I say the arts. What do you think of? Okay. And I'm going to give you another second, and I'm going to say, if I think of art students, <laughs> what do you think of? And unfortunately, the arts, the first thing I ask you to think about, people will probably think about Mozart, Handel, Picasso, fantastic people, but not real people, different people, special people. 
I asked you to think about the art student. What will you think about? Self-indulgent, uh, possibly staying bed until lunchtime, not very engaged with the real world, um, different. <laughs> These are the types of things. Or as my mother would say, interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> that is simply incorrect. Today, art means business. Art is the bedrock of creativity. It drives innovation. At Ulster University, when we think about arts, we think about advertising, animation, architecture, design, technology, textiles, photography, moving images. These are all part of our creative industries. And technological progress and organizational change has moved to a whole range of thinking jobs. And companies are consistently telling us they want people with a certain type of skill. Remembering that knowledge is moving so quickly that no sooner have you learnt your theory until it's redundant. So what exactly are we trying to do here? We're trying to identify and push key transferable skills. And what are they? Employers, oh, going back one. Employers will tell us that they want people who are problem solvers, who work in collaboration, that horrible phrase, they can imagine, they can think outside the box, they don't simply look for answers, but they say, why is that the question? Why can we not think about it in a different way. So there are different types of thinkers, but it's largely about the ability to think differently. And the key point that I would like to say when we're thinking about these students is that many of the jobs that will be available in the future don't yet exist. They're using technologies that have not yet been developed, and they're dealing with problems that have not yet emerged. That's the key issue for educators. So my contention is we need to bridge the gap, the balkanization between science and art. We need to challenge the view that one is good and one is bad, that one is to be valued and one isn't. Take yourself back to your happiest time in school. Perhaps for you it was that mathematics class. Perhaps it was that physics class. But maybe it was the drawing, the imagining, the nature trails, the freedom, somewhere where you felt you were being creative. Science and art naturally overlap. And they're both means of investigation. They both use hypotheses. They both have theories, and they both generate ideas. So I think to separate them is unnatural. Think particularly about the gadgets that you own. I would say most people in this room own a mobile phone. Yes. A laptop. A tablet. And so the list goes on. Art has the ability to make something which is functional into something desirable. Did you buy that laptop because it was the cheapest? Did you buy that mobile phone because it was the cheapest? Or was it because it was the must-have gadget? And that's about the marriage between technology, design, and branding, and communication. Steve Jobs, who was mentioned in an earlier speech today, and we heard earlier about heart singing. And don't we want to live in a world where our hearts sing where we feel we're doing something of benefit, something that in inspires us to go on and continue. You'll all know who this is. Okay. So I think the goal, if we want to foster innovation, if we want to be at the forefront of thinking, if we want to be at the front of technology, is the marriage between the arts and technology. We need to blur the boundaries between arts and science. So, for example, you'll all know who our friend on the screen is. I don't know if you can see at the back. Captain Spock. 
I've never watched Star Trek, I have to admit. <laughs> but apparently this image from a, an episode of Star Trek was the inspiration behind the mobile phone. Incredible, I thought. I might actually start watching it now and see can I get a few ideas that will change my life. Another episode of Star Trek. And this was the inspiration behind Apple's most successful multimodal program. Because the guy who was watching it realized you could do more than one thing at the same time. Incredible. Origami, the Japanese art of paper folding. This was the inspiration behind heart stents. The idea that they needed something to go into your heart and then expand. That's where the idea came from. It's also, interestingly, the inspiration behind airbags in cars. So it's another example of the marriage between art and science. And I hope most of you who can see this image recognize this bridge as the Peace Bridge in Derry. And when I think about the Peace Bridge in Derry, it's not simply a set of stones moving or connecting one area to another area. What is the Peace Bridge? It's an iconic piece in the landscape. It's designed to be a handshake where people meet at the elbows. That is the marriage of structural engineering, civil engineering, architecture, design, and sociology. It's so much more than a bridge. It's a statement about a city, a city that's moved on. And it's a good example of how all these industries come together to create something that we can connect with, but something that is memorable. So much more than a, a piece of metal or stones, what may have previously been enough to do the job. So I would say art is the heartbeat of innovation. And we need to combine our disciplines rather than reinforce the walls between them. End the balkanization of subjects and end the balkanization of the curriculum. In my role as provost, I will have parents who will come to me and say, you were speaking at a school speech night last night, madam. And my daughter has now decided that she wants to do animation, or worse, video gaming. And I would like you to talk her out of it. <laughs> and I said, well, what would you like her to do? And she said, well, I would like her to do accountancy. No offense to any accountants in the room. Because that's a safe job. She will always have a career. And I think it would be good for her. And I say, does she like maths? No. But she could learn to like it. And so I think that's the difficulty of promoting one subject over the other. Surely in an ideal world, we would push people down roads that they are suited to. And while we talk a lot about STEM and changes in the curriculum, the reality is in education, the dominant paradigm is still around what students know rather than what they can do with the knowledge that they have. Another, oh, oh. <laughs> Another famous scientist put it quite succinctly when he said, it is the tension between creativity and skepticism that has produced some of the most stunning and unexpected results of science findings of science. So in the end, I would like to say to you, I want to live in a world where we can realize the creative potential of all of our citizens, that we don't push square pegs into round holes. The Industrial Revolution was powered by steam, and it is by inserting the A into STEM that we can power the knowledge revolution. In a way, when I think about it, pushing forward with a STEM agenda 
and sidelining the arts is like trying to move forward on a bicycle without pedals. You just simply won't have the momentum. And I want to leave you with an image of me at Kitchbridge Primary School, aged five, now famous for the coldest place in Northern Ireland. <laughs> um, but I wanted to point out that my Tufty Club badge <laughs> was firmly pinned on at my navel because it was the first badge that I ever had. And no one said to me, that's wrong, because we were encouraged to be creative. If that's where you want to put it, then that's where you should put it. And so I'll leave you with the idea that I think we, as a society, want to encourage creativity and have a world full of dreamers, thinkers, and creatives. Thank you. <laughs>